Picture a time when the world was a battleground, a struggle for power and wealth tearing through continents like a wild storm. The British Empire, a colossal force in the 19th and early 20th centuries, was at the heart of it all. As Europe clamored for colonies and resources, Africa, with its untapped treasures, became a prized battleground. The British, driven by an insatiable appetite for power and wealth, embarked on a perilous journey that would leave countless lives shattered and traditions in ruins. The pursuit of imperial dominance came at a harrowing cost. The British Empire's unrelenting thirst for African territories ignited wars, some forgotten by history, but forever etched in the memories of those who endured them. From the plains of Southern Africa to the heart of East Africa, battles raged on, leaving in their wake a trail of death and destruction. As we unearth these stories, we must confront the grim reality. Countless lives were lost in the name of imperial expansion, but the crimes of the British Empire extended far beyond the battlefield. With the insidious spread of colonialism came the erosion of indigenous cultures and traditions. Rich heritages that had thrived for generations were systematically dismantled, replaced by a foreign order that sought to suppress the very essence of African identity. The scars of cultural loss, though often overlooked, remain as poignant reminders of colonial cruelty. This video is a call to uncover the hidden truths, to shine a light on the darkest corners of history. We will reveal the extent to which the British Empire went to maintain its grip on power, the lies, the betrayals, and the deliberate exploitation of Africa's resources and people. Also, as a way of supporting our efforts, hit the like button of the video, share and subscribe to help the channel grow. Your support means a lot to us. To truly understand the scramble for Africa and the British Empire's role in it, we must first step back in time to the late 19th century. The era was characterized by intense rivalries among European powers, each vying for supremacy on the global stage. As industrialization surged, so did the demand for raw materials, markets, and prestige. Africa, with its vast, untapped resources and uncharted territories, became the ultimate prize. By the 1880s, several European nations had already established footholds along Africa's coasts. Portugal, France, and Belgium were among the early colonizers. However, it was the British Empire, with its vast naval power, that would become the driving force behind the scramble. The strategic location of the British Isles, their established maritime supremacy, and a burgeoning industrial economy set the stage for a remarkable expansion. Around 1884 to 1885, European powers convened in Berlin to divide Africa among themselves. Remarkably, no African leaders were invited to this infamous conference. The British, led by Prime Minister Lord Salisbury, used their diplomatic finesse to secure significant territories. The conference set the stage for the imperial land grab, but it also established certain ground rules for colonialism in Africa. With a head start in terms of existing colonies and naval power, the British Empire swiftly moved to expand its African holdings. Their approach was characterized by a mix of diplomacy, military force, and economic exploitation. Cecil Rhodes, an ambitious British businessman and politician, played a pivotal role in British expansion across Africa. His dream was to create a continuous, British-controlled railway from Cape Town to Cairo, uniting the continent under the Union Jack. Rhodes's British South Africa Company, often accused of brutal practices, gained control over vast territories in Southern Africa, including modern-day Zimbabwe and Zambia. The East African coastline was of significant interest to the British Empire. It provided access to the Indian Ocean and valuable trade routes to India. By the end of the 19th century, British East Africa, which is Kenya and Uganda, became integral parts of the British Empire. The construction of the Kenya-Uganda Railway further solidified British control in the region. In a strategic bid to protect their interests in Egypt, the British extended their reach into Sudan. The famous Battle of Omdurman in 1898 marked a decisive victory, solidifying British control over this vital region. Control of the Nile Valley was essential for maintaining the lifeline to India. However, it is one thing to claim a territory for yourself, and it is another to keep that territory when the natives won't back down. 
While the British Empire was expanding its dominion across Africa, it was not without challenges and resistance. Indigenous peoples and local rulers often resisted European colonization, leading to conflicts that would leave deep scars. This is when the British would decide to exercise the full extent of its power, leading to war crimes that left millions death in its wake. The destruction of tribes, traditions, and cities, and the brutal enslavement of indigenous people in Africa are just a tip of the colonial crimes perpetrated by the British in the Africa countries that it forcefully colonized. The Mau Mau Rebellion The British colonial crimes during the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya stand as proof to the depths to which colonial powers were willing to descend in order to maintain their dominion and exploit both the people and the resources of their colonies. It is a story of mass detentions, forced labor, torture, and the suppression of a grassroots movement for independence. The term Mau Mau was originally used by the British to refer to the Kikuyu Central Association, or KCA, a nationalist organization that played a role in the rebellion over time, it became associated with the broader anti-colonial movement. The Mau Mau Rebellion emerged as a response to British colonial rule in Kenya, which began in the late 19th century. The Mau Mau movement primarily consisted of Kikuyu people, Kenya's largest ethnic group who felt marginalized and oppressed by British colonial rule. Kenyan nationalists sought to end colonialism and gain independence. The British colonial authorities had implemented policies that dispossessed Africans of their ancestral lands, pushing them into overcrowded reserves. Many Kenyan farmers lost their livelihoods and faced extreme poverty as European settlers took over their lands. The British also failed to acknowledge the soldiers that fought and died for them in World War II. Many Kenyan men served in the war, and upon returning home, they were met with disappointment and a lack of support from the British colonial administration, the stark contrast between the freedoms they fought for abroad and the oppression they experienced at home contributed to their dissatisfaction. The KCA played a significant role in channeling Kikuyu grievances. It advocated for land rights and political representation, but the British banned it in 1950, further radicalizing many Kikuyu members, leaders like Jomo Kenyatta, who would later become Kenya's first president, advocated for peaceful resistance and negotiations with the British. However, a more militant faction within the Kikuyu community emerged, believing that armed struggle was the only way to achieve their goals. The Mau Mau movement became distinct with the taking of an oath that bound its members in secrecy and loyalty to the cause. The Mau Mau rebellion officially began in 1952 with attacks on European settlers, Kikuyu loyalists, to the colonial government and infrastructure. The British and international view was that Mau Mau was a savage, violent, and depraved tribal cult, an expression of unrestrained emotion rather than reason. According to them, Mau Mau was perverted tribalism that sought to take the Kikuyu people back to the bad old days before British rule. The official British explanation of the revolt did not include the insights of agrarian and agricultural experts, of economists and historians, or even of Europeans who had spent a long period living amongst the Kikuyu, such as Louis Leakey. Not for the first time, the British instead relied on the purported insights of the ethno-psychiatrist. With Mau Mau, it fell to Dr. John Colin Carruthers to perform the desired analysis. This ethno-psychiatric analysis guided British psychological warfare, which painted Mau Mau as an irrational force of evil, dominated by bestial impulses and influenced by world communism, and the later official study of the uprising, the Corfield Report. The psychological war became of critical importance to military and civilian leaders who tried to emphasize that there was in effect a civil war and that the struggle was not black versus white, attempting to isolate Mau Mau from the Kikuyu and the Kikuyu from the rest of the colony's population and the world outside. In driving a wedge between Mau Mau and the Kikuyu generally, these propaganda efforts essentially played no role, though they could apparently claim an important contribution to the isolation of Mau Mau from the non-Kikuyu sections of the population. 
The British response to the Mau Mau Rebellion indeed involved the use of harsh and, in many cases, brutal methods to suppress the uprising. The British colonial authorities were determined to quell the rebellion and protect their interests in Kenya. These measures included mass arrests, forced resettlement, torture, and other forms of coercion. One of the most notorious aspects of the British response was the establishment of detention camps, where thousands of suspected Mau Mau sympathizers and rebels were held. Between 160,000 and 320,000 were interned in detention camps, also known as concentration camps. Most of the rest, more than a million Kikuyu, were held in enclosed villages as part of the villagization program. Although some were Mau Mau guerrillas, most were victims of collective punishment that colonial authorities imposed on large areas of the country. Thousands were beaten or sexually assaulted to extract information about the Mau Mau threat. Later, prisoners suffered even worse mistreatment in an attempt to force them to renounce their allegiance to the insurgency and to obey commands. Prisoners were questioned with the help of slicing off ears, boring holes in eardrums, flogging until death, pouring paraffin over suspects who were then set alight and burning eardrums with lit cigarettes. The use of castration and denying access to medical aid to the detainees by the British were also widespread and common. Among the detainees who suffered severe mistreatment was Hussein Onyango Obama, the grandfather of former U.S. President Barack Obama, the first black man to lead the United States. According to his widow, British soldiers forced pins into his fingernails and buttocks and squeezed his private parts between metal rods. The Hola Camp massacre in 1959 also stands out as a particularly grim example. Hola Camp was established to house detainees classified as hardcore. By January 1959, the camp had a population of 506 detainees of whom 127 were held in a secluded closed camp. This more remote camp was reserved for the most uncooperative of the detainees. They often refused, even when threats of force were made, to join in the colonial rehabilitation process, or perform manual labor, or obey colonial orders. The camp commandant outlined a plan that would force 88 of the detainees to bend to work. On the 3rd of March, 1959, the camp commandant put this plan into action, as a result of which 11 of the detainees were clubbed to death by guards. All the 77 surviving detainees sustained serious permanent injuries. In an effort to hide the brutality of their death, the British would cover up the case. After the Hola massacre, the name of Hola was changed to Galol by the colonial government in order to ensure their atrocities never saw the light of day. However, fate had something else in store. The first report to surface about the incident was in the East African Standard. The front page article reported that 10 died at the Hola detention camp. The paper quoted the official statement from the colonial authorities. The men were in a group of about 100 who were working on digging furrows. The deaths occurred after they had drunk water from a water cart, which was used by all members of the working party and the guards. More information about the incident emerged in the weeks that followed the initial reports. An investigation into the deaths ensued, and it was discovered that the 11 detainees did not die of drinking foul water, but as a result of violence. The medical examiner said, they had died from either lung congestion or shock and hemorrhage following multiple bruises and other injuries. The coroner reported, the injuries of a number of Mau Mau's apparently were consistent with their allegations that uncooperative prisoners had been beaten by guards, apparently with the consent of the commandant. A report in the June 1959 edition of Time magazine entitled The Hola Scandal described the events. The report stated that on the 3rd of March 1959, 85 prisoners were marched outside and ordered to work, but dozens of the prisoners fell to the ground refusing to work, and were beaten by the guards. When the assault had concluded, according to the magazine, 11 prisoners lay dying, and another 23 needed hospital treatment. Once the inquiry findings were made public, the opposition members in the House of Commons called for a debate. Increasing adverse publicity and calls for further investigations of human rights abuses in the camps led to a reduction in UK governmental support for the Kenya Colony's administration, and resulted in accelerated moves towards Kenyan independence. 
From 1954 to 1960, the British detained approximately 8,000 women under the emergency powers imposed to combat the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya. The majority of female detainees were held in Kamiti detention camp, and its importance has been widely acknowledged by historians. However, new documentary evidence released from the Hanslope Park archive since 2011 has revealed the existence of a second camp established for women at Gitamayu, created in 1958 in order to deal with the remaining hardcore female detainees. Furthermore, as the Mau Mau rebellion intensified, the British implemented a scorched earth policy in some areas, where villages suspected of supporting the Mau Mau were burned down, livestock confiscated, and inhabitants forcibly relocated. The goal was to deny the rebels local support and resources. By 1960, according to the Kenyan Human Rights Commission, the British had killed, maimed or tortured 90,000 Kenyans and detained 160,000 in camps. Ultimately, the Mau Mau uprising ended with the capture and imprisonment of many of its leaders and the defeat of the armed insurgency. However, it played a pivotal role in Kenya's path to independence. The negative publicity from British colonial crimes, the Hola massacre, and other forms of violence put pressure on the British Parliament to take action to salvage Britain's deteriorating image. Colonial detention camps were closed throughout Kenya, and the prisoners were freed soon after. Attempts were then made to find a solution to maintaining British interests in Africa without the use of force, indirectly leading to a hastening of independence across British colonies in Africa. In 1963, Kenya gained independence from British colonial rule, with Jomo Kenyatta, a former detainee during the uprising, becoming the country's first prime minister and later its president. With independence achieved, the British would leave Kenya. However, many records related to the Mau Mau Rebellion were kept secret or destroyed by British authorities. This has led to accusations of a deliberate cover-up to protect the reputation of the colonial administration. It wasn't until later, after Kenya had gained its independence, that some of these records were declassified and made available to the public. These documents shed light on the extent of the brutality and abuses committed during the Mau Mau uprising, showing how far the British was willing to go to keep Kenya under its grasp and continue to claim its resources for itself. The British government, after being continually defeated in the High Court, agreed to settle the Mau Mau case in 2013. On June 6 that year, then-UK Foreign Secretary William Hague announced 5,000 survivors would each receive £3,800 payment, and he also expressed the nation's sincere regrets to Kenyans, who were subjected to torture and other forms of ill-treatment at the hands of the colonial administration. The Boer War more than a century ago, 48,000 people died in concentration camps in what's known as the South African War between 1899 and 1902, or the Boer War. The Second Boer War, also known as the Boer War, the Anglo-Boer War, or the South African War, was a conflict fought between the British Empire and the two Boer Republics, the South African Republic and the Orange Free State. Over the empire's influence in southern Africa from 1899 to 1902, following the discovery of gold deposits in the Boer republics, there was a large influx of foreigners from the Cape Colony. They were not permitted to have a vote and were regarded as unwelcome visitors, invaders, and they protested to the British authorities in the Cape. In 1899, war erupted between Britain and white Dutch settlers, the Boers, in South Africa as Britain looked to extend their influence into the Boer-controlled Transvaal and Orange Free State. Negotiations failed, and in the opening stages of the war, the Boers launched successful attacks against British outposts before being pushed back by imperial reinforcements. Though the British swiftly occupied the Boer republics, numerous Boers refused to accept defeat and engaged in guerrilla warfare. In response, the British adopted a scorched earth policy where they would burn and destroy Boer settlements to deprive them of homes and food supplies. British High Command ordered several scorched earth policies to be implemented as part of a large-scale and multi-pronged counter-insurgency campaign. A complex network of nets, blockhouses, strong points, and barbed wire fences was constructed, virtually partitioning the occupied republics. 
British troops committed several war crimes and were ordered to destroy farms and slaughter livestock to deny them to Boer guerrillas. As Boer farms were destroyed by the British under their scorched earth policy, including the systematic destruction of crops and slaughtering of livestock, the burning down of homesteads and farms, to prevent the Boers from resupplying from a home base, many tens of thousands of women and children were forcibly moved into the concentration camps. This was not the first appearance of internment camps, as the Spanish had used internment in Cuba in the Ten Years' War, but the Boer War concentration camp system was the first time that a whole nation had been systematically targeted, and the first in which whole regions had been depopulated. Eventually, there were a total of 45 tented camps built for Boer internees and 64 for black Africans. The camps were poorly administered from the outset and became increasingly overcrowded when British troops implemented the internment strategy on a vast scale. Conditions were terrible for the health of the internees, mainly due to neglect, poor hygiene, and bad sanitation. The supply of all items was unreliable, partly because of the constant disruption of communication lines by the Boers. The food rations were meager, and there was a two-tier allocation policy, whereby families of men who were still fighting were routinely given smaller rations than others. The inadequate shelter, poor diet, bad hygiene, and overcrowding led to malnutrition and endemic contagious diseases such as measles, typhoid, and dysentery, to which the children were particularly vulnerable. Coupled with a shortage of modern medical facilities, many of the internees died. Over a hundred thousand Boer civilians, mostly women and children, were forcibly relocated into concentration camps, where 26,000 died of various causes, mostly starvation and disease. Black Africans in the same areas were also interned in concentration camps as well to prevent them from supplying the Boers. 20,000 died in the camps as well, largely due to the same causes as in the case of their Boer counterparts. After nearly three years of intense fighting, during which both sides suffered heavy casualties, the British ultimately prevailed due to their superior resources and tactics. The war ended with the signing of the Treaty of Vereeniging on May 31, 1902. The treaty recognized the sovereignty of the British crown over the Boer republics, while granting significant political and civil rights to the Boers. The Boer War left a lasting legacy in South Africa. It contributed to the unification of the country and set the stage for the formation of the Union of South Africa in 1910 which brought together British colonies and former Boer republics under a single government. It also left deep scars, with bitterness and division between English-speaking and African-speaking South Africans persisting for generations. Over the years, historians and scholars have tried to take blame away from the British on the motivations and circumstances surrounding the establishment of these camps and the treatment of their inhabitants. Initially, the British portrayed the camps as places of refuge for Boer civilians, particularly women and children, who were affected by the conflict. The British government claimed that the camps were established with humanitarian intentions to provide shelter, food, and medical care to those displaced by the war. Scottish historian Niall Ferguson has also argued that the British no more desired the deaths of women and children in the camps than of the wounded dervishes after Omdurman or of his own soldiers in the typhoid-stricken hospitals of Bloemfontein. However, as the war progressed and reports of high mortality rates and harsh conditions in the camps emerged, public outrage and international scrutiny grew. In response, the British government launched investigations and made efforts to improve the conditions in the camps. Still, many historians argue that these actions were inadequate and that the suffering endured by camp inhabitants was substantial. It is undeniable that the efforts of the British led to a significant number of women children, and others, including both Boers and Black Africans, suffering and dying in the concentration camps during the Second Boer War. Regardless of the intentions behind the establishment of these camps, the harsh living conditions, inadequate medical care, and limited resources contributed to a high mortality rate among the camp inhabitants. The British Empire, at the zenith of its global influence, held sway over vast territories and diverse populations across the world. While the British Empire is often celebrated for its contributions to science, culture, and governance, it is also a historical fact 
that its colonial rule was marked by a range of actions and policies that today are viewed as deeply troubling. The concentration camps during the Second Boer War, with their high mortality rates, are just one example of the contentious aspects of British colonial history. While the British Empire played a pivotal role in shaping the modern world, its legacy is marked by a dark history of exploitation, violence, and oppression in various parts of the world. Other well-known instances of British colonial crimes include the Malayan Emergency. The Malayan Emergency was a guerrilla war between British Armed Forces and the Malayan National Liberation Army MLNA, the military wing of the Malayan Communist Party, which began four years before Queen Elizabeth's reign and continued eight years after she ascended to the throne. The MNLA sought independence from the British colonial government and began waging guerrilla attacks on rubber plantations, police stations, and transportation and infrastructure networks. On June 18, 1948, in response to these attacks, British authorities declared a state of emergency, triggering a 12-year-long war and scorched earth terror campaign in which the British military set fire to homes and farmland belonging to those suspected of having ties to the MNLA, relocated an estimated 400,000 I to 1 million people into concentration camps called New Villages, and sprayed crops with Agent Orange to starve insurgents. The emergency was declared over in 1960, and by that time, an estimated 6,700 guerrilla fighters and over 3,000 civilians had lost their lives. Military strategists and policymakers still study the Malayan emergency today as one of the few successful counterinsurgency campaigns undertaken by the West. The Bengal Famine of 1943 The Bengal Famine of 1943 is a stark example of the devastating consequences of British colonial policies during World War II. It is indeed a tragic chapter in the history of British colonial rule in India, marked by policies that prioritize the needs of the British Empire over those of the Indian population. Several factors converge to create the perfect storm for the Bengal Famine. First, British policies in India had resulted in the exploitation and impoverishment of the Indian population for centuries. The British had imposed a system of land taxation that often left Indian farmers with very little to subsist on. Additionally, the policies of the British colonial administration had disrupted traditional food distribution systems, making the population vulnerable to food shortages. During World War II, the demands of the British war effort led to further economic exploitation of India. British authorities requisitioned rice and other essential foodstuffs from India to feed British troops and the civilian population in Britain and the Mediterranean. This extraction of vital food resources from Bengal, a region heavily dependent on rice cultivation, exacerbated the food shortage. Winston Churchill's role in the Bengal famine has been a subject of controversy and criticism. His decision to prioritize the allocation of Indian-grown food to support British troops abroad, even in the face of a severe food shortage in Bengal, has been widely criticized as callous and indifferent to the suffering of the local population. When hearing about the famine, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the UK, is said to have remarked the following. The famine was their own fault for breeding like rabbits. The comment attributed to Churchill is emblematic of a broader British colonial attitude of racial superiority and indifference to the well-being of colonized peoples. Such remarks, if accurate, reveal a deep-seated prejudice that influenced decision-making during this critical period. As a result of these policies and actions, an estimated 3 million Bengalis perished during the Bengal Famine of 1943, making it one of the most devastating famines in modern history. The historical record paints a stark and unsettling picture of the British Empire's legacy in the countries it colonized, particularly in Africa. It is a legacy stained with the blood of countless individuals who suffered under the weight of exploitation, oppression, and brutality. While today's Britain often proudly touts its commitment to peace and progress, it is essential to remember the darker chapters of its history. The stories of those who endured the British Empire's rule must not be forgotten. These narratives remind us that even nations that profess to stand for justice and equality may carry the heavy burden of a colonial past. Acknowledging this past and its implications is a crucial step towards building a more equitable and just world. By shedding light 
on the injustices perpetrated by the British Empire. We not only honor the memory of those who suffered, but also underscore the importance of accountability and reconciliation in our shared human history. It is only by recognizing the stains on our hands, both individually and collectively, that we can work towards a future where the lessons of the past guide us toward a more inclusive and compassionate world. This brings us to the end of this video. Tell us what you think in the comment section, as we are always interested in your thoughts. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.